Hello, I'm Helen Blackburn of Open Wealth Management and I'm delighted to be here at Threadneedle's offices in London and even more delighted to be joined by Richard Colwell, who's one of the country's leading fund managers. Part of what Richard does, he manages a number of funds for Threadneedle. I've particularly come to talk to him today about the Threadneedle UK Equity Income Fund, which I know many of you are now invested in. Richard also manages the Threadneedle UK Growth and Income Fund, the UK Overseas Earnings Fund, the Money Extra Income Fund and co-manages the Threadneedle UK Equity Income Fund and Equity Alpha Income Fund. So before I start talking to Richard about the fund that we use for you, which is the UK Equity Income Fund, I'd like to ask Richard some other questions about fund management and specifically about his views with regards to passive and active fund management. There's still a lot of sceptical people out there that feel that maybe Passive fund management is the way to get best returns from the FTSE 100 and they don't necessarily see any great value in a, a fund manager being able to outperform that index or indeed any others. So Richard, I'd just like your views on that if you wouldn't mind. So right, yeah, no, well actually I'd, I'd like to name check your own report on your oh, website. thank you. Because I need some <laughs> good material on there yeah. on, that, on that issue. Yeah. So I'd endorse some of those points and hopefully got a few few extra on Brilliant. that. So, yeah. so first off, yes, it is a truism that if you looked at the median of the whole universe of active funds, then you know maybe you would say, oh, why bother? I'll, I'll stick to passive, it's cheaper, etc. Okay. But the whole point, hopefully, for you as advisors and, and as me as an active manager is to demonstrate that the best uh, uh, active funds can uh, meaningfully outperform o o over t a decent time frame uh, their underlying in indices yeah. and that's what we're all about. So I passionately believe that the markets are inefficient yes. and therefore that we can add value yeah. and that I'm not a busy fool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, but, but hopefully uh, your clients are, are investing uh, not just for the next month or just on a one year basis because at various times uh, you know you very good active managers, whether it's the Anthony Boltons, etc. You know they will underperform, you know, yeah. uh, for for a, a period. But it's the aggregation, meaningful compounding outperformance. Yeah. You know, makes sense. Yeah, so and it's this medium to long term approach. That's what's what all about. about. Yeah, exactly. and, and actually, the growth of uh, of the passive industry. In, in many ways lends itself to the better active managers in, in, in the sense that you know I think it uh, accentuates the inefficiencies in the yeah. market um, and I think it's, it's worth reminding clients that if you're buying a passive index you are getting all of that volatility yes. Um, and we as active managers can hopefully exploit that. Uh, uh, you know, when you get sort of the madding crowds being very, very fearful about Europe, the world yeah. is ending, etc. Uh, 18 months or so ago, then that creates great opportunities at the stock level, yeah. um, uh, and we can exploit that. Yeah. Um, and if you're buying uh, the index. Uh, in the UK, you're getting big dollops of exposure to, at various stages, oil companies, mining companies and banks, mm -hmm. where hopefully, whether it's on the growth side or the income side, active managers can give you uh, greater diversification yes. uh, whilst backing their own conviction yes. where they've got stock ideas. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Um, well, yours is obviously a great example of a, an actively managed fund launched in uh, 1985 and is now worth some £1.8 billion. Pounds. Um, I'd like Richard now to talk to us about um, his approach to identifying the stocks and the companies that sit within his fund. And I notice um, his description of one of the ways that they uh, the investment approach is plain vanilla, so if you could talk to us about that too, that, that would be good. Yeah, uh, yeah, so in terms of that, that point on plain vanilla, I suppose it, it was, you know, we're very aware that uh, UK income is a very competitive space, mm -hmm. a lot of very good fund managers, so, you know, we, we find ourselves strangely differentiated, we think, uh, in, in the respect that, as you say, we are plain vanilla, myself and Lee Harrison, who's been running this fund uh, since he had joined Threadneedle at, at 06, and, and uh, I rejoined him having worked with him previously at a different house uh, just over three years ago. Um, you know, we are UK stock pickers, mm -hmm. so uh, the UK income funds uh, that Oakland, uh, uh, um, you know, have on, on the, the recommendation list 
is a UK stock picking fund, so we're not apologetic about that. This is not a mirror image of exposure to the UK economy. It gives you good exposure to great franchises, you know, with world class businesses, okay. but it's all about valuation. Yeah. So um, a lot of our rivals uh, have taken the decision to. Uh, uh, Increase exposure in their funds to overseas listed stocks. Okay. And, you know, we haven't got that, so it is what you see on the tin. Yes. It is UK stocks, okay. uh, and in terms of the yield that we're generating, it is at the portfolio level. So it's okay. not just stuffed full with every stock having to have a specific yield. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the yield is at the portfolio level, so we okay. can back our ideas in recovery situations or growth situations as yeah. well mm -hmm. to, to give you that you know portfolio construction. Yeah. And nor do we try and enhance the yield by use of derivatives. There's no derivatives, no overseas listed stocks. Yeah. Um, so that's what we mean by playing right. vanilla. Okay. In terms of the other aspects of your yeah. question about how we find ideas, yes. um, you know, yeah, very much it's we're not it's not sort of two men and a dog uh, and, a, and a phone sort of uh, you know sort of trying to find a few ideas. We're very much uh, part of a very strong team. Uh, you know, there's about there's about 14 of us who are involved in UK equities at Threadneedle, uh, and we run in aggregates around 15 billion pounds. So you know, that's a big critical mass. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're an important player in, in the UK market. So we've got the resource within that team. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of it different experiences and strengths in terms of industry knowledge. Uh, and style of investment as yes. well. So, you know, we, we learn from each other and there's active debates on, on stock ideas. Um, so that's important. And also we get great access to companies management yes. because of, you know, the, you know we, we do represent a meaningful part of the market. Yeah. Now, we don't want to just sort of, uh, you know, go back to passive, we don't yeah. passively just yeah. accept <laughs> what company yeah. management say and just sort of let them turn the pages. You know, the active dialogue we have with managers is important to make sure you know there's 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 not sort of hyperbola about certain product one year and then no mention of it the next year. Yeah. It's about consistent message and delivery of the strategy in relation to results. So that's an important aspect yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of how we dis you know with that behind us yeah. myself and Lee about how we we, we construct our portfolio for UK income. Yes. It's it's very much you know we're we're passionate about the idea that, you know, as long-term investors, we want to be patient. and We don't want to be sort of reactionary to what's going on in the market. We're not day traders. That's not our skill set. We don't think our clients would want us to be risk on, risk off. Sure. And it goes back to that exploiting that, being on the other side of that volatility, really. Uh, and, you know, when you get uh, this phrase, what's the catalyst? Well, it's valuation. Yeah. So, you know, coming out of the credit crunch three years ago, there's fabulous opportunities of businesses that people were scared of because the balance sheet had got inappropriately skewed to debt situation, uh, maybe then underinvested in one part of their business, or people were just playing macro weather forecasting, saying, oh, I don't really fancy the US housing market, or what have you. Yes. And it's sort of going under the bonnet, if you like, yes. and looking at the business and what are the levers that a, a, a management can can control to improve the profitability and crucially improve the cash flows yeah. to drive a, a, an attractive dividend growth, okay. which is what ultimately we're looking That's for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then having made your selections of the companies that sit within the fund, how do you track their performance and, and what is the, the catalyst, if you like, to make changes if the company starts to go off the ball, for example? Yeah, I mean, that's... It's the, yeah, the big challenge is, is if a stock's gone right for you, not just to sit back and say, aren't we clever? Yeah. You, you, you've, totally, you've got to yeah. be your eye on the ball uh, and keep kicking the tyres to reappraise the investment thesis. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very active in, what, in the research we do but it's a lot of it is under the water, really. Yeah. There's a lot of stocks that we don't own it at all, where we've done probably most work in the last year or so. Okay. Uh, and it's about it's just being alive to opportunities, um, but being you know the, the main driver out will probably be opportunity cost of new ideas, okay. or you know we, we clearly we, we always get some stocks wrong where our uh, thesis was wrong, um, we didn't appreciate some of the challenges. Um, you know, so we're, we're not a, a, a
afraid to put our hand up and say we got that one wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's sort of case by case. Yes. But uh, I would say, you know, there's sort of this notion that it's sort of a sign of virility, how much trading you've done, and <laughs> new ideas, yeah. and all the rest of it. Yeah. Well, actually, it's about, you know, but there's nothing wrong with buy and hold. No. Our stockbrokers don't like it, but yeah. if you can get in at the right valuation, yeah. um, you know some of the, the biggest and uh, most successful investments we've made uh, over the last few years are still big, big holdings, yes. which is you know yeah. uh, uh, something we'll, we'll touch on in yes. a bit. But yeah. it's it's just sort of reappraising rather than just saying, oh, it's reached a price target, out it goes. Yeah. We're not mechanical like that. It's yeah. it's what well, we bought it as a recovery situation. But where, where are we now? Is the cash generation worthy of further re-rating? Are we interested in the next stage of the strategy? Do we think that's fully appreciated in the stock market? Yeah. If not, then we're very happy uh, to carry on owning it. Yeah. But, but as I said to my earlier point, you, know, you, you want to try and avoid the kind of notion of a comfort stock. And you know, just because uh, it's a good company doesn't mean to say it's a good investment. Yeah. So it is. You, yeah, keep reappraising, keep sieving yeah. through new ideas which might drive out existing holdings, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's not a mechanical approach. Okay. okay, so turning now to your top five current um, holdings within the fund, would you like to tell me about that? So what, and a little bit about why you chose them and why they're sat there. Yeah, so I mean, sort of uh, some of the biggest holdings, uh, both in absolute terms but also relative to their weightings in the index, are uh, holdings like BT, um, AstraZeneca, the pharmaceutical company, okay. Legal and General, uh, Unilever, and RSA, or some alliance. So they're, they're all got. We think, obviously, <laughs> fascinating yeah. uh, sort yeah. of investment thesis yeah. uh, and attractive valuations. But I think uh, what's interesting is that a uh, good three of those have been very powerful uh, outperformers. Mm -hmm. And yet, going back to the earlier point, you know, we still feel that they're they're attractive holdings, and we we wish to have them as as big parts of the portfolio. But going back, BT is a classic, really, because what we're all about really is trying to challenge accepted wisdoms, really. Um, and you know, buying BT four or five years ago, you can imagine evoked quite strong response from clients, sort of like, why are you yeah. buying that? It's a yeah. massive pension deficit stuck on the end of a lousy telecom company. Because yeah. we've all got anecdotes of yes. poor service, etc. But the, the notion of it as, a, as an interesting investment back then was that having cut its dividend, having got into trouble with its global service business, um, and with this huge pension deficit, the, the questions that we need to get comfortable with were, are there enough levers to generate the cash to, to fund that pension mm -hmm. deficit, to fund the fibres of the home investment that the government's so keen on, and crucially, can they then start to grow the dividend? Uh, and, and you know, they, they've delivered that uh, under the current management, and you know, we're really pleased with that yeah. as, a, as, a, as a business. That the you know the rump, if you like, probably about half of the valuation is in open reach, which is like a utility. Yeah. So in many ways, BT was sort of our favoured utility, really. Um, yeah. And it's that sort of that that network finally after years of uh, headwinds in terms of competition yeah. and price deflation. It, it's the fact that the you know the, the sort of desire for broadband and the, and the data growth you know really plays into BT's hands, yeah. um, and that they've executed very well in terms of the rollout of fibres of the home yeah. versus a lot of other yes. countries. Yeah. Um, so you know they've managed the balancing act very well, and we've seen the shares re-rate nicely. But we still think from here uh, we can get double-digit uh, dividend growth. Uh, in the next few years, uh, and you know, an attractive valuation against all the utilities, and you know, the yield stacks up in, in its own right. Yeah. So that's a good example yes. of, of that kind of buy and hold, but keep reappraising. Yes. So the obvious question is, I, I, what are they doing yeah. trying to buy football rights? That's sort of a bit <laughs> off the beast. So obviously, that was a, an issue that we had to get comfortable with and yes. understand what 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 are they trying to do because. In the past, anybody who's gone up against Sky has come away with a bloody nose. Yeah. So the, the notion is we think the management kind of earned the right to, 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 to go for this. And the, and the rationale is really to, to make customers more sticky mm -hmm. to their broadband offer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and the fact that they've been able to take out yet more costs, that almost pays for, for the extra investments yeah. in content. Yeah. So we're keeping a close eye on this new level of strategy. Yeah. Yeah. But it's no knee-jerk, oh my gosh, 
we don't like this. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's it's, it's it, you know we think it's fascinating really. So mm -hmm. it's, um, we don't think there's any valuation in, in for that aspect of, yeah. of the business to try and generate uh, additional revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, legal in general is another good one of a similar notion that you know it's a stock that we bought. Uh, Back at the time of the credit crunch, where you recall that the license of legal in general well, shares were think, trading below 50 yes. pence, and yeah. the hedge funds were attacking it, saying it was a bank in disguise, and all the corporate bonds that it owned as uh, uh, part of its um, annuity business, uh, you know, could be impaired. And we just, you know, thought that that was just the wrong, the wrong uh, uh, conclusion, and that uh, inherently this business ought to be cash generative and very stable and we're pleased to see that you know that sort of starts to come through that we're on the business just chase any old volume business yes. regardless of returns yes. is yes. much better discipline yes. and the fact that people say oh it's a bit landlocked isn't it in the UK you don't want to be exposed to the UK but actually you know they've got fabulous annuity business both bulk yes. and individual yeah, no. and it's and it's really that I mean <laughs> ironically we just talked about passive investing yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, but obviously uh, uh, Elgin as a yeah. business it, yeah. it has been very successful yeah. um, and arguably there's very little value even in the shares at this price yeah. for that business mm -hmm. so again it's sort of uh, buying it on an attractive distressed yield and having seen the the dividend growth come through very strongly and again you know we think for the next few years yeah. double digit dividend growth uh, and despite the re-rating of the shares still think there's, there's good scope for further outperformance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and then third one, uh, Unilever, which which is interesting. Uh, you know, the market that we've had, risk on, risk off, yes. kind of in yes. many ways, Unilever sort of under the radar, just kind of scoring singles yes. uh, all the time. And uh, you know, we think it was a sort of a super tanker that for many years was a bit, you know, sort of accident prone, sort of either uh, underinvested it uh, and then and then sort of thought, oh gosh, we'd better spend some more on marketing, so it was a bit knee-jerky. Whereas over the last sort of five years or so, it's really got its act together and, and um, sort of, I think, is, 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 is more than a match in that for the likes of P&G and yes. Benkiza. Yeah. And, and, you know, over this four years, just before this uh, meeting, just have a look at it, for the last four years, it's given us a total return of over 80%. So, you know, that's what it's bread and butter exactly. is. It's yeah. a very stable business. Yeah. And it's getting in at the right valuation when it was yielding well over four, much better yields than was available on its own corporate bonds. Yes. And it's just steady 16% uh, compound yes. return, you know, yes. sort of 12 capital and with that four yields. Um, so, you know, yes, it's re-rated and it's on a decent premium now to the market. So again, got to reappraise, yes. are you yeah. comfortable? Uh, is it getting dangerous in terms of valuation? Our conclusion is no. We think okay. uh, you know that, that actually it stacks up valuation against its own history yeah. and it can preserve that kind of premium. Because in this kind of world of scarce growth, if you like, yeah. I would pay a premium for uh, you know resilient yeah. cash generation yeah. with their profits that drop through into cash and support that sort of High single digit yeah, dividend growth. Like doing that yeah, so that's what it's about. Yeah. Rather than sort of, you know, sort of going out on a limb, yeah. trying to find the next triple bagger. It's just these yeah. the compounders that keep yeah. doing doing yeah. a job for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on the other side of those, the top five, I suppose yes, yes. the RSA and AstraZeneca yes. uh, are the jury still out, really. Okay. But uh, okay. in terms of they've not contributed particularly uh, to performance, not in capital terms, albeit we've collected very attractive dividends. Yeah. Um, I suppose the thesis on AstraZeneca, which has been a bit in the news recently, mm -hmm. cause new chairman, new CEO, and they yeah. just had a big uh, investor day, is the perception is it's a, uh, been a, a drug company that's failed to find anything in its broom cupboard of any meaningful new blockbusters for quite a few years, and it's got some very well publicised patent expiries coming up. Okay. So that's going to be a big headwind to in terms of, you know, it's going to, uh, you know, see a big drop off it in turnover. So how can it withstand that and continue to pay dividends and can it ever find any drugs to come through the pipeline and give you that operational yes. gearing? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, again, it's being patient investor. You know, we're very animated about the fact that you could see a re-rating here long before you get the kind of uh, evidence of, of new sales from new drugs. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we do think that there's enough flexibility in the organisation taking costs out and uh, you know so, so, so to keep generating cash okay. through the dark you know the yeah, trough yeah, yeah. years to pay the dividends. So we think we're paid to wait with an attractive yield, and we don't think there's any valuation in there for the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And it's funny analysts, you know, you know, very sort of. Uh, given up the ghost on it, but I think they can turn on a sixpence yeah. very quickly, and you can see a re-rating just as you did with things like Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, yeah. uh, which also went through its own mm -hmm. uh, patent expiry. Yeah. So we think that's an interesting, interesting yeah. stock. Yeah. And then Raw Suns has been in the news uh, recently because, and it was a surprise to us as well. <laughs> put our hand up to that yeah. you know they decided to to reduce the dividend payouts, mm -hmm. albeit uh, it's still you know in the top sort of. Uh, 10 or so yielders in the market, oh, well over 5, and it's going to be growing from uh, the cut base. Um, the thesis on why we like RSA is within non-life. We think it's got a fantastic franchise in Canada and Scandinavia, very high return businesses, and their peers that are quoted separately in those uh, markets are rated much more highly than is factored into the RSA share price. And we think they've endured, which is partly the reason why they decided to reduce the dividend payout, they've endured this huge headwind over the last few years because obviously one of their uh, um, avenues of, of, uh, of income is investment income. Mm -hmm. And with uh, short dated bond yields, as we all know, yeah. being back down here, that's yeah. been a heck of a headwind to compensate for on the, on the underwriting side. And so, in a way, I think you know that you, you, you know what you, as an active investment, what you're looking to get in is uh, exposure to stocks on what you perceive as sort of fairly trough profits on what you think is a relatively low valuation, the kind of double counting yeah. that the market is prone to do. And so, we do think RSA from here uh, is a very interesting situation. And you know, yes, the shares. It's disappointing that maybe the communication could be better on that dividend cut. But from here, you know, we, we think it, that it is interesting. So, you know, we have built up our position yeah. uh, still further since that 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 cut and various meetings we've had with the management. Okay, that's great. So, well, Richard, that was absolutely fascinating. Thanks for your insight into no, the fund and, and, and how you do things. And uh, I'm sure, hopefully, we'll be uh, doing this again some stage uh, in the future. Yeah. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks for your support. Bye.